Hello there and welcome to episode 142 of Fear of a Black Planet. I'm still working on songs for this gig coming up at New Year, so if anybody is listening to this before New Year and fancies something to do at the last minute, I'll be playing at the Troubadour on the 31st of, Jan- uh, 31st of December. <clears throat> I don't know when I'll be on, probably about eight o'clock, probably eight or nine-ish. Um, as I said last week, there's rock and roll downstairs, folk music upstairs. It's a really great gig for me to get. Um, I'm really chuffed with it. You know, it's got the whole heritage of Jimi Hendrix, Dylan and all that, the whole folk scene from Davy Graham, the whole folk scene from the 50s, so I'm really chuffed about it. So do come along if you fancy it, and I'm just working on a bunch of songs, actually quite enjoying it, um, just working away on, I've had been trying to work on some new songs, but uh, I've actually mainly been trying to get some songs that I've forgotten, that I've got on my list, that I keep on my guitar, but that have just kind of drifted away from my set list in the last year or so, so just trying to work them up again and also, one of the things you find as a folk singer is, well, I found it, is that my grasp of the melody, of a traditional melody, will change and morph and develop as time goes by. When I first started out, there was really nothing. There was no pointers at all for what I was trying to do in terms of Scottish songs. And I get the feeling it's a bit different now because there are a lot more people out there doing it. You do see a lot of people on YouTube and stuff doing Scottish songs, so it's not so obscure as it was maybe five, six, seven years ago. Uh, I started in 2013. That was, I think it was October 2013 that I made my Facebook page that's now deleted, but that was my kind of moment where that this is what I'm doing. I'm a folk singer and I'm a poet. I'm a writer and a performer. The two have to go together. And... uh, But at the time, I just didn't know, you know, I didn't, I mean, I still don't know how to play guitar properly, (laughs) but I don't want to play guitar properly. Does that make any sense? I don't want to be a good guitar player. I don't want to be good. The point is not to impress people. The point is to overcome myself. That's the the thing I'm trying to put across, is that... uh, yeah, self-conquest is where the meaning in life comes from. That's cl- It's not quite grasping what I'm trying to put across, that phrase, but that's as close as I can get. So the idea is not talent. The idea is how much you've conquered yourself and, and not taking no for an answer in terms of there's no inevitability. Like I, The point is your agency and your will are more important than your talent or your circumstances or your environment. That's the point I'm trying to make. And if people don't want to believe that, then I accuse you of being a uh, fatalistic nihilist. That's what you are. You are a fatalistic nihilist. And I've noticed that people on all sides of the political spectrum fall into this trap. It's the seedbed of ideology is that kind of fatalism because then you say, well, I need this ideology to save me from inevitabilities of circumstance. Whereas... I'm coming at it from, well, I don't care how crap I am at guitar. I don't care how untalented I am. I don't care how unacademic I was at school. I've decided who I am, and my will conquers. Facts. Fuck facts. Fuck facts. So that's the way I look at it. And it's not fuck facts in a kind of, oh, fake news, I believe what I want to believe. No, it's not that. It's an artistic response to so-called inevitabilities. Um, So that's kind of what I'm trying to put across. And so it's not about being a great guitar player. It's about how much you've developed over yourself. And I've noticed that as I practice these songs, the melodies, I get more of an ear. Because when I first started out, the the closest thing I had was obviously Dylan, uh, Woody Guthrie, you know, and they're not exactly melodists. They're just, that's a kind of, Johnny Cash, that's a kind of storytelling tone that you take and that's great I still love that it's still what I aspire to but with Scottish songs 
the melodies are, are much more complex than, say, like Carter family versions of American songs, which, is, you know, I'm not putting it down at all. They're different things, really, although they come from the same root. So there's a paradox there. They're very different, but they're the same. And I kind of find myself in that paradox as a folk singer a lot. So, yeah, the, 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 the melodies become more subtle. The, the my ear for melodies anyway become more has become more subtle, but whether that's actually translating in performance is another bloody question. Um, but yeah, when I started out, it was um, very strange because basically most of the old recordings. Say if you if you were like and if you want to go into Americana, you know as if the world needs another Americana singer. But if you wanted to do that, then there's plenty of old records you can go and figure out with great accompanists. And there's a whole tradition of accompaniment. And a company, accompaniment and accompanyism is an art in itself. It's different from being like a symphonic violinist or something like that. It's, it's a particular kind of musicianship, which is very simple in terms of technique, but um, has particular points that you have to hit and quite difficult to do along with the voice and but in america there's a whole tradition of it the, the Carter family tradition and the sort of finger style old timey blues tradition uh all of that exists and is very strong and is preserved but when i first started out with the scottish stuff it really wasn't there it was really just a cappella recordings and um Yeah, so I kind of had to make it up as I went along. As I learned how to be a musician, I had to kind of learn how to be an accompanist. So I had to learn the appropriate type of accompaniment to certain songs. And a lot of the time I was just blagging it, obviously, as you do, uh, just blagging it. And, and maybe I started too early and maybe I put myself out there too quickly. I think I did. Um, and certainly the vision of what I was trying to do and what I'm still trying to do was not really translated into the performance of what I wanted to do. Certainly not in terms of technique, but not just that, in terms of even just the impact of the songs that I'm looking for. That's something I'm still journeying on. Um, so I'm I'm kind of... Uh, sorry, I just got a text there. I should turn this off just now. Um, yeah, so I... Uh, so I, I'm at this stage now where I guess I've learned a bit more and I'm, I'm and I'm more attuned to what I to melody and to folk song and I just going back over songs that I learned very early on as it, when I was busking and I was just trying to basically amass as much of a song collection as I could because when you're busking you can play five songs over and over again and you really do need some variation or else you go kind of crazy so I got a song collection where even if I was playing for hours I could never exhaust all the songs really I mean often you'll play songs twice because you enjoy them so much but just having a bank of, of songs that you don't always play every day and working on those that was enough to go on but um but something happened, you know, something happened around 2016. Ah, no shit, Sherlock, eh? The world went to fuck in 2016. But something happened in my own music in 2016. I just kind of lost heart in performing. After having been really hitting it hard in terms of performing and really very determined and fixated on the idea that performing these songs was what I should be doing. And if in doubt, get out and play songs. I mean, there was a whole period when I first started playing folk songs that I just, I just got up and I just, whenever I got up during the day, I just grabbed my guitar, head into Camden and stand on the street and play. And that was just like, whatever I'm doing, that's what I'm doing. And for, and I did that for years. I mean, that was just like, if in doubt, what else am I doing today? Right, bang, just get out, play a guitar. That's it. So it was kind of like a, a very fixated view of playing. And then just about 2016, that all went to shit. 
Well, it didn't go all to shit, but just... I hit a wall. I guess you do. I, hit, I guess you... Maybe it wasn't so negative. Maybe, it, maybe my vision of it, because I was so OCD about the what it should be and how it should be, and I had this sort of abstract vision of what it should be, I saw that it was a bad thing that I was no longer feeling that level of consistent devotion to it. But maybe that was, you know, I didn't stop being creative. I just, I got more into writing, I guess. I was reading a lot more. So I guess there's other things that come into play when you're an artist and you just have to let that go. You can't be, you don't, you're, there's no obligation to be consistent when you're an artist, actually. And in a way, you shouldn't be. In a, in a way, it's, it goes against being an artist to be that consistent. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so I don't really know what happened in 2016, but I think, I, think, I think really, in hindsight, what I've been going through is a kind of recharge, a re-examination of what, why I'm really doing it. Also, the realization that, you know, the modern world is not in any way going to resemble Greenwich Village in their 1964. You know, it just isn't going to be like that. And and, a re, and maybe just growing up and a realization that I already had unrealistic idealism, but the world has changed so much and I am a lot older than I'm willing to admit that suddenly just that horrible realization that, oh, hang on, and not, not only is it slightly unrealistic, your vision of the world, but it's completely unrealistic. It's not going to happen. Like, it's the, like, even if you're successful, quote, unquote, you know, it would be, it's going to be a different version of success. So, yeah, and by the way, I, I make no apologies for having an unrealistic view of the world. That's an artist's prerogative, in my view. I intend to impose an unrealistic vision of the world. I intend to, to burn a hole in the culture, culture. I intend to carve a fucking dent in the cosmos. I'm not here to play nice. This is a kind of terrorism, this music. A beautiful terrorism. It's meant to be impact. It's not meant to be nicey-nicey background noise, muzak. Um, which is what a lot of folk music has become. Just dreary background noise. But, um, yeah, so it's been interesting kind of, what's the, what's the word? Um, consolidating, bringing it back together again, you know, bringing certain aspects back together again. So, Yeah, I don't know what I mean by that. What do I mean by that? What's the word I'm trying to... Galvanizing. Regalvanizing? Can you regalvanize? I don't know. Reconsolidating, I think, is probably the closest I can get to it. Um, I Sorry, that was um, the doorbell there. Um, yeah, and I've been taking it slow as well. I don't know, it's just, I think that it's a number of, combi a combination of things. I think a large part of it is personal stuff where you, you just realise that what you're up against as a performer sometimes feels less than worth it. That partly there's, I've talked about this before, there's so many people doing it now it's not a rare thing to be a guy with a guitar, let's put it like that. We all know that. Um, and of course, there's plenty of much better guitar players than I will ever be and ever want to be. So in terms of the actual market of what people want in terms of a musician, it's not what I'm delivering really as a, you know, what I'm doing is pretty archaic and antediluvian for a starter. But then also the political climate with, you know, the Charlie Hebdo and the Bataclan thing, and you think, is this the, you know, is this the upper limit? So just that whole thing, and I've talked about this before, but I think I'm taking it slowly, trying to, to re-establish the, the core enthusiasm of, of why I wanted to perform in the first place. And 
maybe get rid of some extraneous ego shit that gets in the way of that it can't help but seep in because you're a human being and you want to to assert your a, a sort of a feeling of empowerment within the world but if that's on shaky foundations and you're trying to and you haven't really created solid foundations for yourself psychologically or just in terms of your place in the world then that will you can't really be a performer you can't really be subject to people's well, there's a great film on Netflix. Um, I stopped my Netflix subscription, but it's probably still on there, the John Mellencamp film. And he talks about why he does it and what motivates him. And he says, it's nothing to do with you as the audience. I'm not doing it for you. I do it because I feel I've got some connection to the muse and it's my job. That's I feel strongly that that's what I'm here to do and I try to develop it as much as possible and try to be as much of a craftsman as I can as an artist just to live as an artist, just the satisfaction of living as an artist and it's not about impressing people and that really st stuck with me actually because if you're constantly at the mercy of people's reactions to what you're doing then you go, you, you're not going to be... you. you you're not going to be a powerful artist, but you're not going to be a happy artist because you can't please all the people all the time, essentially. And it's more about... I don't know, because you, the, the other side of that is you don't want to just be completely ignorant of people's reactions. So you're not being ignorant and closed off to people's reactions and a certain amount of what you do as, a, as an artist is about not pleasing others, but delivering for others in some emotional way. But the the idea is not that you're that you can be an impactful artist without pleasing other people. Because sometimes, you know, it doesn't doesn't really make sense, does it, to say that Bob Dylan or Ice T please their audience? Do we re do people really want Ice T to cow and bow to the audience, or do you just want to just want to get up, see him get up there and do what he does and get off on that? You know, it's not about pleasing. It doesn't. He doesn't care if you like it or not. But and and in that not caring, he delivers exactly what he's meant to deliver to you as the audience. So it's a kind of paradox. The act of not pleasing, not seeking to please, is exactly what's going to give you the the power to deliver the gift that the audience wants from you. I don't really know what how what else or how else to describe it. I really I don't know what's going on. It's a mystery. But it's certainly if you you certainly ruin it if you're trying to please and and maybe I had too much of that, or at least a desire for a reaction, a desire for oh well done yeah you know which is natural. I'm not sorry about that. That's completely natural for a performer to have that. But there's a point where a performer has to move past that in order to be in any way consistent or in any way a substantial artist. So, I, you know, I, I mean, it's still in this, I, you know, I'm, I'm opening up here about a, a kind of inward thing that I'm going through. But don't worry, all you little druggies and psychological experts so-called out there don't think you're getting any secrets. I'm holding back here, so all the, the juicy, vulnerable stuff, because this is war, and I'm at war with smugness. I'm at war with amateur psychology. I'm at war with Tricky Dicky. So don't think I'm giving away anything, any, any vulnerabilities here, and if you step to me, I will fucking crush you. I will fucking melt you. Um, I'm just saying that I think this is, this is interesting stuff from general creative points of view. That A, we have to adapt so that sometimes there's just this different urging, you know, maybe you've been writing poems for the last five years and suddenly you've got an idea for a novel and that becomes your thing and you have to kind of be okay with that, even though all the world tells you that that's wrong because uh, the lazy world tells you who do you think you are and then the sort of ambitious world tells you, no, be consistent, don't just deviate and throw, you know, jump from one pan to the other. But as an artist, you you know, you have to be irresponsible 
as an artist. You can't be too consistent. You can't be too responsible. And I think that there needs to be some kind of making peace with that in an artist's own mind. A certain amount of irresponsibility and a certain amount of, and also the second part being a certain amount of displeasing other people or, or of not pleasing other people not giving them you're not here to give them an emotional tonic you're here to deliver an experience of beauty which is a different thing you know again we can defer to to sir bob dylan here he doesn't get on stage and please anybody, and it's in, 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 in and it's in protecting that creative space for himself that he really does deliver potent performances, and it's something to behold when everything locks into place at a Bob Dylan concert. And that yes, and I think that 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 is very different from. You know, it's it's not the same kind of vibe as sitting around with your mates in the pub and making them laugh and then getting a kick because you've pleased all your friends and everyone loves you. It's not that at all. That's not what performing's about. That's not what... And I think that that's where... That's certainly where the, neuro, the neurosis and the, the, the craziness comes in for performers because sometimes they can't separate that. And, 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 and if you're trying to use the act of performing as a way of psychologically as a tonic for your own psychology uh, and if you're trying to make yourself the tonic for other people's psychology in order to make yourself to, to find your own tonic you know basically being a people pleaser so you know trying to make other people feel better so that you feel loved if you're trying to do any of that shit if, if any of it's trying to compensate for something then it's dangerous territory. Not not because it's bad. It's not bad. It's a completely natural thing to do. I'm not sitting here in judgment of it because it's it's a tendency that I've got and every and the loads of performers have got. But the ones who stay sane are the people like Bob Dylan or Ice T or uh, James Brown, where it becomes a craft in itself, and it isn't really about whether they they have some kind of shallow oh, I really enjoyed it, it's whether they're getting some deep emotional kick out of it. And that's a different thing. You're not talking to their conscious version of themselves as an, as an audience. You're going into the subconscious, whether they like it or not. And so it isn't about pleasing them. In fact, they can get a kick of it, out of it without, with, while being displeased. That's kind of rock and roll and the blues, you know. It, it isn't about... I don't care whether you like it. I'm here to, you know, I'm not here to give you what you want. I'm here to give you what you need. Um, and that's a, that's a different question. But yeah, you, you can go nuts if you're if you're not if you're trying to compensate within yourself for something and trying if you're trying to use art as a way to compensate. Now, art can be very healing, but that's by the by. It's not you can't make it a compensation for some psychological lack. And but as I say, it's very natural to, to want to do that. And it is natural to want to do it. And To some extent, it works, but it it isn't consistent. I guess is what I'm saying. And maybe I maybe I had got into a subconscious zone of that where I wasn't really realizing that that's what I was doing. But that's what I was doing. Um. But the trick, the, the the real trick is, and this is the hard, I mean, this is the trick for all of us, right? Whether you're a performer or not, whether you're an accountant or whether you're a guitar player, it doesn't really matter. The trick is to be the source of your own healing, the source of your own power. And uh, that's a very difficult thing to do, but it's it's basically the art of being a human being. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do now, is to, to, to present a, a performance on stage that isn't dependent on the contingencies of people's moods or whims or whether they like it or dislike it. There's a kind of higher order motivation and it, it you know it has nothing to do whether I'm good or I'm bad. 
It has nothing to do whether people are pleased or displeased. It's it's more about a ministry, you know. You try to do your best. You're not, you know, some, you know, like a minister in a church. Some sermons are going to be better than others. It's a, you know, you, as a parent, one some days you're going to be a better parent than other days. But it doesn't mean that you stop being a parent because it's so, you know, because it's inconsistent. The real point is, is you're bringing presence. You're delivering some kind of humane presence to the situation, whether you, you know, whatever you're doing. So I guess that's what it is. And uh, you have to dig deep to find the source of that humane presence, and that changes for everybody. And it's all about our values, and it's 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 personal, but it's solid, and it's 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 a it's a base of strength. On that subject, actually, so last week I was talking about Cal Newport, the writer, and his book Digital Minimalism. Well, I've downloaded the audiobook. And I've been listening to it at night, so I haven't really been, you know, taking notes on it. But basically, I was listening to it last night, just as I was drifting off. And he was saying that the science shows that his whole thing is that we're being deprived of solitude. The the more connected we are, we're losing that ability to be alone with ourselves and to hear our own thoughts and to not be connected. And he says that there's a lot of science and psychology behind the idea that it's fucking crucial to have solitude if we're to have healthy relationships, paradoxically. Because I, I haven't listened to intently, I have to go back over it, but basically there's some sort of science which says that our default settings when we're not engaging in connecting with others is to process our connection and our place in the world with others. And if we don't have that ability to do that in solitude, then there's no wonder you get anxious because a certain level of uncertainty and you're not, you're not, you don't feel, you're not able to do, this is, this was a technique that was developed over millennia of evolution. So what's happening with the reward systems and the addictiveness of, of, of social media is it's playing with our finely tuned balance between solitude and relationship that evolved over centuries. And now we are, we're in, and part of our derangement of the moment is because we can't, we can't find the space to process our position and our relationship with others. So there's a certain amount of necessary evolutionary reflectiveness that is in our default mode. And they know this because they can. there's certain parts of the brain that um, go off in, in scans at these when, when these kinds of thoughts are being processed. And they found that newborn babies have that. It's activated from birth. So they come out of the womb with this part of the brain which goes off in term when you're reflecting about your social standing your status your your relationships with others in solitude so that it's a default setting it's called um and we and 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 if we don't have solitude we don't have the time to go through this it's sort of like a, i suppose it in a way I, you could say it's a kind of psychological digestive system and 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 what we've been robbed of is the ability to digest properly our our relationships so that they they become more fraught perhaps we maybe that's why it it becomes harder in 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 an overly connected world to be at ease with other people that maybe things like agoraphobia and social anxiety become more prevalent i've definitely noticed that in me and that's possibly that's maybe that's one of the it's tied in with this performance thing that you know when when all this digital culture just started to become just too overwhelming and so dominant in the culture it's almost impossible to be a performer because that being a performer is so such an intense connectivity to other people that if you don't have the the counterbalancing boundaries of solitude for that then you go absolutely nuts because how do you process that it's not a natural way of dealing with people in the savanna is it to be standing up on a stage to hundreds of people so 
I guess that's that's connected in some way. But uh, yeah, I just thought it it was interesting that and you know he's got a whole load of stuff as to how the engineers developed this system of keeping a the, the our attention, our psychology is the is the product. So our captive attention is the gold that they're trading in. So that's scary. The, and, and the idea is that they're doing all they can to erode our agency and our ability to decide not to do it. So And that's why it's so hard and, and part of the reason that it creates a certain amount of misery and this, this background noise of anxiety and, and, and edginess is because we're not getting that natural solitude to digest our relationships, to digest our connections with the world, with the environment and with others. We we need a certain amount of back, you know, quietude and distance from others in order to have really healthy relationships. So it's that sort of paradox. Um, actually, he does talk about Walden, Thoreau's Walden. And, you know, Walden had been criticised because... Although he um, Thoreau had been criticised because although in Walden it's this sort of paradigm case of a man going off into the woods and being alone with himself, they found out that he wasn't really that far from civilization. That he quite frequently walked into to to the local town and met with friends and quite often had people with him. And it wasn't really that distance. There was a main road nearby, so it was um, in the woods, but not really wilderness. You know, it wasn't miles away. But actually, Newport says that actually this is the strength and, 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 and Thoreau was never really trying to to make that claim that he was some kind of, that he was kind of going into a, a noble savage kind of state. He was more saying that Thoreau was that it is possible to have a certain amount of wilderness and wildness and natural... You can become part of a natural ecology while being part of civilization. That it isn't. It doesn't need to be a zero sum game. It doesn't need to be either or. And so that was interesting, and I think that that that's what we've lost is when we, so that the idea is that we and this is definitely true. And I sort of have beat myself up in the past about it because my ideal would be to have a place that's secluded enough where you have your own space, where you have that solitude to think, and and the space for contemplation, basically, but also that you have a certain amount of company, manageable company, and you have intimate relationships, and you have a certain tribe, if you like. But Cal Newport's pointing out this is actually that that's not some that's not just that's not wanting to have your cake and eat it. There's nothing wrong with wanting that balance. That's actually what we're built for, and I suppose that would make true if we if indeed we were for thousands of years. And this is just speculation on my part. I'm not. A, I'm not an anthropologist, nor am I a scientist or an evolutionary biologist. But you know, if we were what they say we were, which is hunter gatherers that lived in tribes, then of course that would be true, and it makes sense because, you know, I don't know. Incre increasingly, my idea is somewhere between. My ideal is somewhere between a kind of Oxford college and a travelling troop. <laughs> so you've got this world unto yourself but you've got, but you share it with a with a select group of others you know whether that's a kind of traveling band or whether it's a nice cloistered collegiate contemplative monastic kind of environment both of those are attractive to me um and both you know all th those are very different types of life but they share that same balance of solitude and and in, and and social environment and it was just, I, I think the the big takeaway for me from that is that it doesn't have you don't have to be ashamed of that 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 kind of wanting your cake and eating it in terms of so socializing and solitude is really correct that's that's what your nervous system is built for and so if you're if you're overextended in solitude and you're com and you're completely cut off from people. You go stir crazy. And if you are completely overwhelmed with constant connectivity and stimulation and so and 
and your social reward systems are constantly overrun and you're and you know then you go stir crazy so and in, in a way one of the promises of social media is that you can have your cake and eat it but in actual fact that connectivity you can't shut it off that's the problem that it becomes addictive and his other point is, as far as I can remember it, and I haven't got the details in my head, but the, the, the reward systems themselves are so finely tuned. You know, our ability to read other people's body language, our ability to read other people's um, assent or dissent from what we say, you know, unspoken things, you know, all of these things are, are completely messed with in terms of the, the little red dot or the little red heart kind of very reductive forms of social reward and response that are on social media so we're putting all that we're bringing with us all this finely tuned meaningfulness through social rewards that have evolved over millennia and they are they're all you know they're mixtures of spoken and unspoken and we're and we're putting all that into getting a little heart like update notification and then when it doesn't deliver it, it sends us crazy whether we admit it or not because it doesn't have that meaning and 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 and, and so if that over i mean one of those over time will just be slightly confusing okay i don't really know what that like means but over time that drives you nuts because your nervous system is so finely tuned to pick up on much more precise and accurate versions of response from other people that if you're just relying on that then over time it, you're kind of I guess you're kind of sort of gaslighting yourself because you, you end up not knowing where you stand with people. That's definitely true with me. For, absolutely. Uh, anyway, I think I'll leave it there. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I'm going to go out and try and get some daylight. Uh, I'm going to try and go for a walk. I know that's another thing he says in the book, actually, is that walking in solitude without your fucking phone is <coughs> is an essential part of of that solitude and that and an, a natural balanced processing of your own mind. And we have lost that. If you, you if you're constantly trying to share with others, oh look, I'm in this lovely part of the woods with these trees, you know, and I'm talking about myself here, constantly sharing on Instagram, you're not really having, you're not really getting the fruits of a long walk. So, anyway, I recommend the bit. I'm not really giving the full lowdown here. As I say, I've just been listening to it as I drift off to sleep. Um, but I really, I can't evangelize for Cal Newport and digital minimalism enough. And it really does sound like one of those horrible, like, Marie Kondo, declutter your life, fucking yuppie bullshits. But it isn't. It's, this guy is not like that. He's almost the opposite of that. He's saying, look, there's a reason why you're miserable. There's a reason why social media and the news system is driving us nuts. Because it's all designed not just to overwhelm us and to capture our attention, but to fuck with our reward systems that are built into our neur neurons and our nervous system over centuries. And all of this is being screwed with and we need to reclaim it if we're going to be able to handle it. And we don't need to get rid of it. It's not about being a Puritan. In in fact, it's about being, it's in fact his, I, I guess that, that, that could be the easy thing you could say. You could say, and that's normally when I see something like Maria Kondo or whatever her name is, I think, oh God, some, another fucking yuppie telling me to, to be more zen. But he's not saying that. In a way, he's sort of being more hedonistic, uh, more Epicurean. He's saying that if you really want to flourish and, and really, you know, exist fully as a human being, you have to reclaim certain parts of your, your nervous system here because this much connectivity is not what we're built for. Uh, and part of that is going for long walks. Part of that is is reclaiming that time which we are slightly scared of, we might get bored, we're slightly scared of, that we might be alone for for long, you know. We need to embrace that and enjoy that and realise that that's part of what it means to be human. I don't know, maybe this is all fucking obvious to you. It wasn't to me. It's, you know, um, you know, we, we all suspect it, but having someone put it so clearly, as I said last week, he has this very amenable clarity in the way he speaks. And it just makes you like him. 
Because he's, cause you know what it is? He's not preaching. He's not coming at it from that yuppie, I figured out the new lifestyle choice. It's not about that. In fact, it's the antithesis of that. He's just saying, I'm a bit of a nerd, and I realized things were getting a bit fucked up, and I looked into it. Here's what I think. Bang. Don't believe it, or don't believe it, but it's pretty rational. It's not preachy. He's not saying you're a bad person. He's saying it's perfectly natural that we would get into this situation. And actually, one of the things he does say is it's perfectly right. You know, it's it's perfectly inevitable and predictable that we would be addicted to the screen it's not our solely our fault and lack of responsibility and lack of discipline that's drawing us into instagram because these things are designed like that he's a computer engineer and the, and, the, and, and billions of dollars he says has been put in to creating this level of addictive product so it's not entirely our fault as individuals, that, that we are addicted to these things, although we can do something about it. So it's a, it's a nice balance. He affirms agency, but he doesn't make you feel ashamed for being a completely undisciplined, decadent moron. Uh, okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening.